10.33 a.m. on June 19th, 2019, the meeting of the Governance Organization Legislation Committee of the Council. Um, we are on video, and so just making that noted to anyone in the room so that they know. We have a quorum of three members out of our five with two members absent, so we can call to order and start. So the first item on the agenda is a continue to follow up on the committee charge update request. Um, I, we had assigned two weeks ago George to come up with a list. Did, were you able to create that within two weeks? I did. Uh, okay. I mailed it to myself, and if I'm able to, uh, yeah, it's, it's somewhere on my in the uh, mailbox. <laughs> and I can share that with you if you want. Yes, that would be great, because I don't think either of us have seen that, right? Yeah, so if you can... While, while he's working on that, I'm gonna jump to item six on our agenda, which is the adoption of the May 22nd and June 5th minutes. We don't have them ready yet, so we will be skipping them and postponing that to the next meeting. Just to announce that and take care of that right now. possible that I could, are there 14 things that are supposed to be this morning we put them out the door at eight that would make sense do we want to possibly because we only have three of us here just push that off to the next meeting well, the or at least yeah. move on to our next thing and then if you find it we can come back to it yeah I'm, it's, if it isn't here it's not here um, it's still on my computer at home um, it's essentially a list of the two of the the committees divided by town manager appointed and select board appointed that are five years or older um, and can be um, edited and you know it's a it's a, it's a word uh, excel document um, and i can send it to everybody today no that sounds great okay, um i'll do that i'm sorry just for curiosity before we move on how about how long was the list uh, <laughs> i believe it's about 30 committees and that i don't have an exact number but, um, and, and we'll be able to go through it and decide that some of them are ex, uh, maybe not, but anyway, yeah. about 30. Okay, I, I was just my curious. my re recollection. Sounds good. So we're in agreement we will push this back to the next meeting. With George to email us that document for posting. That brings us to our next agenda item. Continue consideration and discussion of revisions to newly adopted rules of procedure. And then I created a list again um, to see where we would get to it. And the first one on this list is a vote on a motion from the last meeting, which was moved to add a section 2.2H to the rules. Um, actually, before we start, let's just I'll be on the same page here. I posted to SharePoint the modified, the latest modifications of the proposed, or latest proposed modifications to the rules. Um, we can go through, as we go through them, I'll indicate what I'm doing on these. You'll see is as we act, I'm creating a comment that shows that we've done something so that we can track sort of what we've done since everything is, non nothing's being accepted so that the council can see the changes. Um, so I did not update the table of contents in terms of creating a new one. I did add the right headers so that when we do update it, the appendices will be listed. Um, and then, you know, there have been a couple of sort of just clerical changes but then we're back into section 2.2. We had, this is powers and duties of the president and vice president. Um, one of the biggest changes you'll see throughout the whole document is I went through and added all of the hyperlinks for the charter, any MGL reference and any um, uh, 
CMR reference, Code of Massachusetts Regulation references. So it looks like there's a lot of changes. They're almost all just hyperlinks. Um, so the motion that's on the table, and I'll take thoughts on whether we should act on that today with only three of our members here, um, was to add to the powers and duties of the president's section a new letter H to serve as spokesperson of the full council. And that was a motion that was made last meeting on June 5th, but that we decided we all needed a little bit of time to think about as to whether we wanted that in there or not. And now we're missing two members. So I would take thoughts on whether we should postpone that yet again or not. Here. Evan. Two weeks feels like a year. Um, and so I went to look at the minutes to remind myself what the discussion was, and of course they're not there. Um, but one question is, do you have who made and seconded the motion? Because I don't remember, and it could have been me. Yeah. So um, my notes from last week show that the motion was made by Steve, seconded by Evan. Um, to add that language, service spokesperson of the full council. Um, the only other notes I have is that George indicated that the rules give guidance, but this doesn't seem to give guidance. Um, and Pat said she kind of agreed with George, but none of us, because it was sort of a new discussion, were really comfortable on making that decision last week. So that's what I have in my notes. So this is technically still an active motion? Yes, it is because we used our right to postpone or some, I, I mean, I don't have notes on, but we sort of agreed by consensus that we needed to postpone action on the motion. It feels weird to vote on a motion when the maker of the motion is not present. I agree. Yeah. I agree, it's unfortunate, but. Uh, yeah. Also, I think we really need the minutes. Um, I think Kevin's right that uh, two weeks is a year, it seems these days and without a written record of what transpired. It's, so again, if we could just remind the minute takers that, uh, yeah. and maybe they're here and I just don't see them. But, uh, I, I haven't yeah. been able to find them or, and they have not been emailed to me either. Okay. Yeah. There, was no there was not. Okay. Well, um, we know where they live. So. <laughs> we'll so I am making a note that we are postponing until the proponent of the motion is present and the minutes are available on A. The next one is per the clerk of the council, advise on language for passage of executive session minutes in a timely manner and prior to end of legislative session. So I spoke with our clerk of the council and I think given what she said, um, I think this ended up putting something into Section rule eight, I think, no, nine, 10, wherever minutes are dealt with. Um, which I can't seem to find now. Minutes, minutes, oh, 3.5, yes, 3.5, thank you. A table of contents comes in handy. Um, so what um, the clerk of the council came back with me at is essentially a copy of um, Northampton's rule on this, which is not what we were discussing last week or two weeks ago, which was how do you pass the minutes in a um, timely manner, but more of how do you make that determination as to when they can be disclosed. The executive session minutes don't need withheld. And this is a modification of Northampton's, the section you know, 3.5B4 is the proposal, I, the language that came from the clerk of the council. Um, based on Northampton's, but Northampton had the president of the council solely making that determination every three months. Um, and the clerk of the council recommended that maybe this council would want to do it as a full council making the determination, not just the president of the council. And so that's the change that has been made from the Northampton language to this, um, which 
also requires then by October 31st of every calendar year that we make that determination. So it's, it's meeting every three months in executive session to review minutes, see if anything can be released, and never meeting after. You know, making sure you've always held that meeting by October 31st, which is prior to a election. Um, so that's the, um, the gist of the proposed language. Um, I can read out proposed lang the language from Northampton that allows the president to do it, which is allowable under state law. Um, but like I said, the clerk thought maybe this council would not want the president making that sole determination. So thoughts? So I'm trying to just process. Um, our discussion two weeks ago, if my memory serves, and again, we don't have the minutes, um, was that it was a discussion about when we can approve executive session minutes, recognizing that there might be long spans of time where we don't go into executive session and there will be just minutes. This seems to have more to do with releasing executive session minutes. Yes. So I, I don't under, I, I'm trying to connect the two. Uh, so this seems different than what we talked about. I, it is. Um, I, I think potentially what I had originally interpreted as the town clerk's request was approving of the minutes, not the, you know, not voting on the withholding or releasing of the minutes because when I wrote her, she came back with this. So I think I might have originally interpreted her request wrong. We might, if we're concerned about both, be able to modify this for approval and um, review, you know, not later than enter into executive session if needed to review the minutes of executive sessions to determine relevant could be if needed to approve and review. I mean, we could modify this to go both ways if we're concerned about them sitting too long because we don't need executive session too often. But it is, it, you're right, different from what we talked about last week, last meeting. George. Just a question for the minutes taker. <clears throat> this document that you're referring to from the clerk of the council is actually in our packet. Um, and right, and I can refer to it in a minute. So the document that is in the packet is the rules of procedure adopted, I'm just gonna read the title, adopted 2019-520 proposed GOL amendments draft revised 2019-65 and 2019-610. Um, and it is in that document as a sort of assert, inserted change under track changes in section 3.5B4. I, didn't, I, I did not put the email exchange between myself and the clerk into the packet. Okay, okay, thank you. Although if you guys want, I'm certainly happy to forward that on. Evan. So the idea being that the council will determine when it's time to release executive session minutes, correct? Correct. So we don't currently have this rule. Correct. So should we not have a rule, who is the default? Um. I don't know, I just know, and we can look up the MGL and I'll do that right now. Um, there are multiple options under the statute for who makes that determination. Um, and let me look up the statute. Chapter 30A, Section 22. So there's multiple options, and minutes of executive sessions, 
um, may be withheld from disclosure to the public in their entirety as long as publication may defeat. When the purpose for which a valid executive session was held has been served, the minutes, blah, 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 um, or any shall be disclosed. Um, for the purposes of this subsection, let's see. The public body or its chair or designee shall at reasonable interviews, intervals review the minutes of executive session to determine if the provisions of the subsection warrant continued non-disclosure. Such determination shall be announced at the body's next meeting and such announcement shall be included in the minutes of that meeting. So that, that nearly, um, I just read chapter 30A, section 22G, one, um, uh, that more mirrors what Northampton was. So they designated under their rules the chair of the public body of the council to do the review at a regular. So if this reads the public body or its chair or designee, it defaults to the council as a whole. So the rule would only, if we put it in as this with a default to the council and keeping it as the council, the rule would just essentially define what a reasonable interval is and add the October 31st first. So it would define that reasonable interval as no more than three months and require it prior to October 31st of every calendar year. We could adopt that the chair does the review instead of us having to convene an executive session if we feel that is more logical. Why don't we offer it and if there's objection then the council can uh, write the uh, way in. But uh, there's a good reason to do it the way that you're suggesting for um, avoiding the whole council having to convene. And I think, um, but if the council feels that this is unreasonable then we could, we'd have to revise it, but maybe it makes sense to give them a, a, a real proposal to uh, respond to and make the case for why we think it's the best option and then they can decide. I, I was gonna read the language directly out of Northampton's, if you're curious. So Northampton has two sections for releasing of minutes. Um, so this would go into four one and four two or whatever it is. Um, the first section is as provided in MGL chapter 30A section 22 G one, the one I just read, the council president with the assistance of the administrative assistant to the city council and city solicitor shall at reasonable intervals, not to exceed three months, review the minutes of executive sessions to determine if the relevant statutory provisions warrant continued non-disclosure. Such determination shall be announced at the city council's next meeting and such announcement shall be included in the minutes of that meeting. The second provision is whenever the council president requests that a vote of the council be taken to determine whether to release executive session minutes, that vote must be taken in executive session. So the second clause actually gives the council president an out to say, I'm not sure I, need, I should be making this determination. I want the whole council to. So under um, Northampton, unless, which seems, Northampton seems to just essentially take what MGL recommends. Right. Um, unless the council president requests it, there is no vote of the town council required to release executive session minutes. Correct. So my personal opinion is um, I understand why this council might not want to put additional powers into the presidency. Um, I also <laughs> if we don't have to have additional executive sessions so that we can review minutes from executive sessions to determine whether they can be released, I would always err on the side of making our meeting shorter and less involved. Um, 
what I did like about what I just heard in Northampton that, that made me a little bit uncomfortable with this proposed language is that essentially it's done in collaboration with the city solicitor and the city clerk. Um, and in this language, it seems as if it'd be solely the decision of the council. Now, my assumption would be in executive session, the town manager would be there, the clerk of the council would be there, so it would still be there. But it, it, it feels like it shouldn't be the decision only of the council to release executive session minutes because much of executive session minutes are so intimately tied to things that the town is doing. Um. I just turned mine off. Do you have any thoughts, George? Evan makes a good point that um, what happens in executive session does involve uh, far more than the council and its, and its actions. Um, so having, if I understand him, having another set of eyes and ears um, in making this decision would be preferable to leaving it to just the council itself or just the president. Is that, if I understand you correctly, you're suggesting having this additional and that is what we see in what Northampton does. Yes. So if we were to use or follow their model and use their language in such a way that um, it had this extra set of eyes um, and we would, it does not have the three months in the October 31st date, so that's something we would put in ours, is that correct? So Northampton's does, the statute does not. So that is something that yeah, we would, if we want a time certain, we should put it in the rules, yeah. And the interval of every three months, defining it as three months? Yes. Would be something we would do. And we have a, the language pretty much written already, it sounds like, if we're happy with it. I think, so, so I've just added that language. Um, we don't have, a, with the assistant of the clerk of the councils, I assume the, the equivalent to the administrative assistant to the city council in Northampton, I'll substitute that to clerk of the council. And then I'll read you the whole thing. And then the town attorney. Um, the decision then becomes, is it the council or the council president? what would we like to propose? I actually have another clarification. Sure. Town, so Northampton has a city solicitor, right? Who yes. can physically be in the room as this is being discussed. We do not. So when we see town attorney, are we expecting mm. that we would send a request for an opinion to town attorney, can we release these minutes? Mm. We could substitute town manager for city solicitor. And then the manager could be. Thoughts? Yeah. The concern seems to be having someone who has a broader sense of the picture beyond just the council and the actors involved. And that would, I assume, be the town manager. If he doesn't, then who would? So um, we could substitute the manager for the uh, solicitor. So shall I read it as it currently is proposed? As provided in MGL Chapter 30, Section 22, 
the council with the assistant of the clerk of the council and the town manager shall at reasonable intervals not to exceed three months and not later than October 31st of every calendar year enter executive session under MGL chapter 30A section 21A7 if needed to review the minutes of executive sessions to determine if the relevant statutory provisions warrant continued non-disclosure. All council votes to release executive session minutes shall be taken by roll call in executive session. I like that. So the question that, that, that final question then is, is this an action of the whole council or is this an action of the president? I think we should make it an action of the whole council um, um, to avoid, well, just it seems unnatural. Um, right? And I have a strong feeling one way or the other, but since the, the council seems to be somewhat sensitive to giving the president what some perceive as excessive powers, this would avoid that objection. And, um, I, I see we have a split um, and we're not at a full committee. Um, I think for now, I might prefer council over president um, simply because we're still wading our way into things, um, see how it works, see if these decisions are more rote or not after we've made a couple, then we can revisit whether it really does need that. I think I would like to add something to this instead of just um, the to review the minutes of executive session to determine if they're relevant. I think I'd also like to add to approve the minutes of executive session and to review to determine if they're relevant so that then every three months at a minimum we're approving any outstanding minutes. Um, as we said, two weeks is a long time. <laughs> I can't imagine waiting six, seven months to try and remember what happened at the last executive session to approve them. Um, what are people's thoughts on that change? Do we know what Northampton's practice is? Nope. Okay. It seems reasonable to me. I agree that beyond three months, we would probably struggle to remember. So uh, that seems like a not, a not unreasonable time frame. So what I read and added was, you know, after the enter executive session under MGL chapter 30A, section 21A7, um, if needed to approve executive session minutes and to review the minutes of executive sessions to determine if the relevant statutory provisions, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like good language? Yes. So I will make a note in the new document I created that on, yep, Evan. I, the reason I um, suggested delegating this authority to the president was to um, make it so that the council doesn't necessarily have to go into executive session more often than needed. Mm -hmm. However, if we're already going into executive session, fair, you know, to approve, I have no issue with it being a council decision. And I think, especially um, what Manny Joe said of let's see what these decisions actually look like first before we decide, um, I think is persuasive. So I would actually be supportive of the council okay. have, maintaining control of this for now. So I've made a note that today we reached consensus on this language. And, and that is in a new document I created that this, I'll relabel for next meeting. Um, that brings us to item C, section 10.10B, 
And this is add language for the process of appointing non-voting finance committee members. So we passed our rules with the rules committee having a document that says in 1010B, process to be added. Um, it's page 26 or 29 of the document, 26 on the numbering. Um, so I thought we should add the language. I did not draft language. Um, I'm thinking the language should be something like process. For This is non-voting members of finance committee. Um, the process could simply be the council shall use the same process to appoint non-voting members of finance committee that it uses to appoint planning board and CBA. It could be as simple as that. I think there'd been some language of do we refer directly to an OCA adopted process or not? Um, I'd love to hear thoughts on how we might iterate a process in these rules for non-voting finance committee members. Evan. So as is widely known at this point, OCA is in the process of thinking about the process to review and revise its process. Uh, and so uh, referring to a specific process would be uh, unwise at this point because that's likely to change. Um, because some things are in flux, while it makes sense on the surface that OCA will adopt a process that will be uniformly applied to any body that OCA appoints, it's not necessarily a given and in theory, OCA could, could decide separate processes mm -hmm. for planning board ZBA from finance committee, um, especially given some of the ideas that people have thrown out for how to appoint planning board ZBA, uh, those would not, some of those would not be logically applicable to finance committee. Um, and so it might be wise for process to just say, um, appointments to the finance committee will be recommended by OCA. Or, or, or mm. We'd write out the acronym um, so that we recognize the authority to put forward appointments rests in OCA. There's no confusion about that, especially given our prior debate over who has that authority. Um, but that the actual process by which OCA comes up with it is within the purview of OCA, not within the purview of the rules. George, any thoughts? You're, right. you're bo both of you are on OCA, right? right? Okay. On, okay. <laughs> and we're both reviewing the process that will be, uh, become the process before the process that mm -hmm. we're going to change to the process. So it's, yeah, um, as Evan made. Um, so there is really no process at the moment you can actually put in here. Um, so, do we make it just something very vague or do we just leave it the way it is for the moment? Do, so, we, do we need to act on this since we don't really have much to, to say? Well, so I think we have a couple of options. Yeah. Um, the charter simply states, council rules shall address the appointment of such members. So we could interpret that as section A, the council, not the president, is the appointing authority addresses the appointment of such members just with A and then leave it at that, modify anything we need to because the heading says appointment process. We could modify that to not deal with process and delete B and just say, you know, council rules addressed it because we just said the council's the appointing authority. Um, or we could go something as vague as OCA, what, what Evan was suggesting. Um, or we could set an actual process forth. I'm not sure I'm for setting a strict, I, I, I'm more of the let's refer to something so that that can be changed without having to change the rules. Um, so I, maybe it's best to just have, you know, 1010 titled appointment of non-voting members of finance committee um, that 
and maybe reword the whole thing to get rid of the thing and just say the council um, is the appointing authority or something like that, although you could just leave the preface in that says council rules shall address the appointment of each mem of such members and then right after that say the council is the appointing authority and leave it at that. Thoughts? <laughs> I, I would get rid of the A and B and then keep the first sentence the finance committee may include members of the public who shall have a voice but no vote in the finance committee's deliberations. And I don't think you need to say council rules shall address the appointment, but we could keep that in there. But these are the council rules, so they're, this is what they're doing. Um, and then just say the council, not the president, is the appointing authority. Um, to some extent, you don't need to call out OCA because it is written to OCA's charge, right? That we recommend appointments. George? No thoughts, really. So if I move that sentence up to after deliberations, we could maybe reference and say per charter section 5.5 .5, comma, the council is the appointing authority to at least reference that the charter says these rules, you know, then we're giving the authority. Does that work for people? I don't know whether I got rid of my hyperlink in doing that. So I'm gonna highlight that for my own reference. Um, and then we're gonna delete council rules shall address the appointment of such members and then A and B in totality. Um, and then in the heading, appointment of non-voting members of finance committee instead of appointment process for. And I'll highlight the whole thing and say what date we did this. just consensus on revision on that one. That brings us, if we're all good with that. That brings us to um, the financial measures. Um, this is section, what part of the charter is this? Um, this is section 8.2C, um, page 21 of the document, 19 in the actual, so 21 if you're looking for a page number. And this is a discussion we started last week at the very end of the meeting and realized we didn't have time to go through it, so we stopped. Um, 8.2C. With that table of contents, you can scroll down the side for them. It's really nice. <laughs> um, and so right now, the language that was adopted is all measures authorizing a loan, the levying of a tax, or the expenditure of money shall be referred to the finance committee when received by the council. The council shall make the referral at the next regular meeting. So as it stands right now, there are no automatic referral of any matters to the finance committee. Um, at rules originally everything was going to be automatically referred but that is not what came to the council because there was a concern that 
um, brought to the Rules Committee that if everything was automatically referred, that meant that the budget under the operating budget, the annual operating budget would be referred immediately upon receipt by the council, and there's language in the charter that actually says that, but that it would be whenever the town manager emailed the council the budget, which could be April 30th, could be May 1st, could be April 20th, and that from that date, the finance committee would have 30 days to report and present on its report to the council per the charter, and there was some concern that that put undue pressure on the finance committee to get its work done within that time frame, given when council meetings are generally held in May, the first and third, not the second and fourth, and given also Memorial Day Monday, where there wouldn't be a council meeting, and so it would shorten the amount of time this finance committee has to actually review the budget. Um, and so, in response to that, towards the end of when rules was passing stuff, we changed the language to no automatic referral. That's what passed the council. That's where it sits right now. Um, but they said, we as governance should relook at that issue and see, do we still want auto do we want it that way where the council has to vote to refer any finance matter? Do we want automatic referral? Do we want automatic referral of everything? Or everything but, say, the budget? Um, and also looking at the charter is everything but the budget still in conformity with the charter. So that's the history. Um, I don't have a ton of notes about this from last week because I think we just essentially got through that and said we don't have time to figure this out. Um, so that's where we stand. There are three options um, that were listed in the rules and obviously three already drafted options we can do whatever we want we don't have to go with any of those three um that were listed in the document that we're working off of for outstanding items so thoughts on do we want to recommend the council maintain having to vote on every referral of a financial matter to the finance committee, or do we want to consider at least some automatic referrals? And then we can discuss if, if we go to the automatic referral, how much? Evan. Uh, automatic referrals make sense to me. I would like to see an automatic referral um, I think it makes sense for the budget to also be automatically referred, except for the dilemma uh, that you presented that was imposed on us by the Charter Commission. Um, and so you're right, if the council, if the Finance Committee always gets the budget on May 1st and has to make a presentation and recommendation to the council, by May 31st, um, that could be challenging, especially given Memorial Day holiday. Um, and so if our read of the charter is that it's not indicating automatic referral, which some reads of it could suggest that, mm -hmm. um, then I would be in favor of the second option that was drafted for us. And just for reference of those um, on video right now. That second option reads, all measures authorizing a loan, the levying of a tax, or the expenditure of money, except for budgets submitted under Charter Section 5.5, shall be automatically referred to the Finance Committee when received by the Council. The President shall notify the Council of the referral at the next regular Council meeting. George. I can't, I find it difficult to make a case for any other alternative, so the second seems to be um, the one left standing. So. 
guess I'm saying I agree with Evan's suggestion that um, this would probably be the best option. It's the one I like too. So um, what I will do is do a wholesale copy of that one and delete the other one into the document we're working on. Um, um, so that the new one is as I just read it. So that brings us to, oh, yep, Evan. I'm not sure this is something we should deliberate now, um, but the uh, 8.2 D, the president shall notify the council of the referral at the next regular council meeting of town manager appointments that have been referred to OCA Mm -hmm. I don't, I'd have to think on that a bit more, but I don't know that that's actually been happening. Mm, that is true. And given that when the town manager, they're automatically referred to OCA, but they don't just go to OCA. When the town manager files, he emails to the entire council, and so the entire council is aware. I'm just wondering if that line is necessary, because I don't actually think there's been a situation where, so... You know, last last week, we had received Public Art Commission, Historical Commission, Local District Historical Commission, and Human Rights Commission. Um, we received them last week. We are not making our, that recommendation not come to the council until the July 1st meeting. The president didn't mention at the meeting Monday that those had been referred mm -hmm. to OCA. And it, so either that rule was not followed well, I mean, that rule was not followed, right? right? But also, I don't necessarily know that she needed to because the entire council received those emails. And so we might not need to deliberate on this now, but uh, I always hesitate to have anything in the rules that we're just going to casually ignore. Yeah. And if we are casually ignoring with no consequence, then perhaps it need not be there. Uh, uh, from my personal point of view, you make a good point. If they're already being emailed to the whole council, does there need to be a separate notice to the council at a meeting? I think the thought could be that that notifying at the next regular council meeting serves not the council, but the public, because the public doesn't necessarily know exactly which appointments have been sent forward. And so that would notify the public of, hey, the managers sent proposed appointments for these six committees on of course if we're going to keep it in we need to get it being complied with um but that is one thing i can see as a benefit to requiring that sort of thing and it can simply be an agenda item that's just sit on the president report agenda item of here's the things but that that's that's an off the top of my head one benefit of keeping it in but that actually does make a lot of sense, actually. Um, and then all we need to do is just remind the president that this is something that she needs to do. And Evan's right that it's not for the council, because the council has been notified, but it's really for the public. And yeah. that does seem important. Yeah. So I think we should leave it in and okay. then just um, remind the president that this is a rule that we need to, to follow. Yep. So are we ready to move on? Next on our list is E, 3E on the agenda. Advise on how to incorporate work groups into the rules of procedure. Um, there is sample language and the reason, so the rules of procedure right now have similar to what it had for finance committee, a big thing on, I'm gonna find it. 
um, 10.5. So 10.5 is where it is right now, and it is essentially in our rules a heading that says work groups will refer to GOL to develop a way to enable work groups. Um, so that's been referred to us. There was, rules had some sample language at one point in the rules that it ended up pulling out, and I will read that language. Um, and then some of the questions that flowed from that, which is why then rules ended up pulling it out and saying this needs a larger discussion. The stamp sample language was standing or ad hoc council committees may establish work groups to consider a measure if they determine that the issue is sufficiently complex to warrant analysis of alternative approaches and or consequences of actions. Work groups shall be given a timeline for reporting back to the originating council committee. Work groups may include members of the public Work groups are usually subject to open meeting law. The chair of the appointing authority shall preside until the work group chair is elected. So the first question that came up from our clerk of the council on this um, was who appoints the work group? And the second question that came up um, was relating to open meeting law and as, as the clerk of the council uh, reminded us, two or more members of a standing or ad hoc council committee constitutes a work group and um, and in some sense to that, once a member of a standing or ad hoc council committee is on a work group, that work group, because it was created by a public body, is subject to open meeting law because it's a subset of a public body. Um, so the usually subject to, she thought might need reworded to our subject to or, or something like that. So that's sort of where we got and we got stuck with, well, who should be the appointing authority on these? How would that happen? What does that look like? And then you start getting into those questions and then suddenly the question becomes very complicated. And so it got pushed to GOL. Evan. So to some extent, um what we're doing here is we're taking a term uh, that could be interpreted a million different ways and using the rules to define it, right? Because work group is, we could call a lot of things a work group. Um, and so in my mind, what differentiated a work group in the context of these rules was that they would include members who are not, or they would include people on it who are not part of the committee that created it, right? Um, which isn't necessarily in here. Um, it just says works groups uh, may include members of the public, but my thought is that a work group might also include other counselors who are not on that committee perhaps, right? Um, because if you're just talking about work group is a, it could potentially be several members of the committee. We, you know, OCA's been doing that, and we're calling it a subcommittee of the committee, right? So we have our outreach subcommittee, which, given this language, would more appropriately fall to, it's a work group. And so I think that we're just trying to figure out, when we're talking about work groups, what do we mean? Um, and I think that we need to figure out what's the purpose of a work group? How is it different from just a subcommittee of a committee, three or four members of the committee doing something independently? Um, and then what applies to that? I, the only thing I will say, I mean, I, I can't think of a situation in which a work group would not be subject to open meeting law. So I, I would, pro I can imagine that usually has to be removed, but. George. George. My thought of a work group is that it would, by almost by definition, or in my understanding of it, would be involving um, members of the public. And maybe that's, in other words, if it's a subcommittee, it would just be uh, uh, you know, members of the council. Though your point is that, of course, what if you're not a member of the committee? And I'm thinking particularly of CRC, where this might be a fairly common uh, thing that they would do, and they would certainly, I would think they would, I would assume they would want 
it'd be open to other members of the council participating, but uh, I would think the main thrust would be to get members of the public with uh, in, involved, um, assuming, I mean, I, looking for their expertise, looking for their, you know, wh whatever it is that they bring to the table. Um, otherwise, it would just be a subcommittee, and, and the committee, they just do whatever subcommittees do. Um, so I guess the first thought I would have is that, that a working group or a work group um, would um, constitute, some of the members would be members of the public and, and or members of, uh, not mem council members who are not members of the committee. Um, does that? So I, I think it could even be broader than that because it could also in theory include say like a staff member. Um, right, and so to me what defines a work group is that some of the members are not members of the, of the committee itself, right? And so it doesn't really matter whether they're public or other counselors or Dave Zomack or, you know, it's just that they're, they're, it's bringing people into committee deliberations that do not sit on the committee. And it sounds like we're kind of on the same page on that, but it's not yeah. necessarily what this language says. And we would assume that they would all have equal voting rights, so um, no matter who's in this body, uh, insofar as they make decisions, everyone has a say. Um, so I guess, it, yes, I, I think that was the goal. Um, one of the things I struggled with between something like this and say an ad hoc council committee um, is what is that difference? Not a subcommittee of a council committee, but an ad hoc committee where we get to kind of define who we put on that committee. It doesn't have to be just counselors, just like we get to define with finance that we're putting residents on. Um, if, if a measure is, you know, if something, and, and I know at our last council meeting, um, Steve Schreiber indicated that they thought the percent for art bylaw that has potential bylaw that has been presented and referred to CRC and finance might be a complicated issue enough to need a small group of people to work on it. Um, you can either do that informally by, say, the Public Art Commission just sitting down and doing it, similar to what Evan and I attempted to do with the limitations on campaign finance of, we're interested in this, let's come up with something. Or you can do it formally, and is the formal, once it's at the council stage, is the formal process a council ad hoc committee. Because um, one of the questions becomes, you've got something, you're sending people out to work on it, you've got a committee that's sending people out, is there knowledge that the council is receptive to the potential for something to be proposed? Um, if you're doing something as a council, the, one of the questions I think maybe we need to start asking before referrals is, is the council likely to pass something or are we sending people off to work on something that has no chance of passage because no one on the council even likes the idea? Um, or does, does it have a chance of passage depending on what it looks like? Um, and a work group created by a committee doesn't necessarily have the chance for that airing. And then you're bringing in, potentially bringing in residents and asking them to work on something versus counselors, we signed up for this, to work on things that may or may not pass. But residents might get frustrated if you start creating groups, having them work on something and then it getting to the council stage and not having a chance. So that's, that's a little bit of a diversion, but I still struggle with is a committee the appropriate place to be creating essentially some small group of people to work on something, or is that more appropriate for the entire council to do through an ad hoc committee? And, and uh, as, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll add one thing as, as, as Evan takes a break, and that is um, 
this is something we struggled with. The goal in rules was ad hoc committees are much more formal. Work groups might not need to be that formal. And so they might not have to go through as formal of an appointment process. They might be able to be quicker and all, but an ad hoc committee has one appointing authority. We know who that is. You know, but that was one of the other things that rules struggled with in terms of this difference was, is there a way to have something that is a little more flexible than maybe a formal ad hoc committee? I think a couple minute break till our one member gets back. We are back on the air after our short break, and we are in the middle of discussing work groups right now. Um, and uh, Can I ask another, sure. uh, uh, well, just a question. We are talking about work groups strictly, this simply concerns obviously the council, right? Yes. And so the manager can also create work groups or working groups, um, for instance, or no? I mean, and that has got nothing to do with us whatsoever. I would argue that has nothing to do with us, and he can do that whenever he wants. Right, right, right. So, good. And we have nothing to say about that, and we're just talking about... When the council can. Council and what that means. Yes. Good. Thank you. Evan. So I'm going back to my, like, elementary school, what, why, who, when, right? And I'm trying to make sure we can answer those questions. So what is a work group? seems to be some collection of members of the council or of a committee and non-members. And so what makes this different from a committee ad hoc or otherwise of the council seems to be that it includes people who are not members of the body that creates it. Mm -hmm. Why seems to be laid out pretty clearly here. To consider a measure, if they determine that the issue is sufficiently complex to warrant analysis, of alternative approaches and or consequences of actions. I'm, I'm not completely sold on that, actually, because it seems like that is tied to consider a work group only ever considers an existing measure. And it seems like there could be the possibility that a work group is formed to come up with a policy. Um, but maybe not, maybe that the council doesn't want that. But to me, it seemed like if there was a problem identified and a committee felt like the solution that they want to propose is outside the scope of that committee itself, they could create a work group to bring in other expertise to help craft something. Um, but this language, as I read it, seems like it's only to consider a measure. So that, that, that seems to imply that there's some existing measure. Uh, the question that Mandy Joe had was, you know, should they be created by a committee or by the full council? And I think I understand the idea being that um, if you don't have a majority of the council who's in favor of such a thing coming forth, then you might be asking a whole bunch of people to waste their time. Um, so. I don't know what to, go ahead, George. I guess I never think that getting a group of citizens involved in town business, town work, no matter how it finally plays out, is ever a waste of time. Um, it's always a risk. I don't see how you can avoid that. You, it's never a foregone conclusion what's going to come from your labors. That applies to us as much as to anybody yes. else. Um, but um, one of the things that's attractive to me about work groups is that, um, assuming they're put together well and they have a clear sense of mission and a time frame, um, it gets people engaged in, in town government and could lead who knows to what. Um, it would be nice if it actually leads to something concrete related to what the work group is working on, but I think irrespective of that, um, it gets counselors and the public and, and staff people uh, engaged in um, the business of government 
And that, I think, is a good right off the bat. So I wouldn't be too concerned about you know, oh, what will happen if you create a work group and then the council decides that, you know, we, we just won't accept it. Because they can do that with anything um, in the end. Um, imagine in, in creating a work group, you, whoever the creating body is, the, whoever the individuals are, it might behoove them to sort of, you know, get a feel for what the sense of the world is out there. But um, uh, in the end, I think there's, there's a good just in, in getting people, good people together, um, and mixing up, uh, I like the idea of, of, of the, the public and staff and so on, working on a specific problem. Um, and I think good will come from that no matter what. So what I'm hearing is we like the idea, we're not sure the how at this point in a sense, um, that we're getting an idea of what they might look like, but the question is, how best to define that in language, to make it as broad as possible, but also to clarify some things. Um, and I'll, Evan? You can finish. No, um, <laughs> and, and so I don't know whether our time right now is well spent trying to hash out that language, right. or whether one of us wants to try to take on, given what's been said here, coming up with something that takes the language that was already done but clarifies things like who appoints, where it's coming from, all of that. Evan. So I would be happy to do that, but I think that I would need a little bit more conversation here to work out okay. a couple other things. I, I can always massage language later. Um, but uh, I th to me personally, it makes sense that either, I, I agree with George, and I, I think it probably is the purview of committees sometimes to be able to establish work groups. Um, when I think about the amount of discussion that we've had over just one small issue, sometimes it might make sense for a committee to say, you know, we've talked about this so much, we need to bring other people in. Uh, for us, the other people were the counselors because it related to the council, not that that was useful. Um, but for other committees, it might mean other people. and so. Um, but I think the council should also be able to establish work groups, right? And so it seems mm -hmm. like, in my opinion, you'd want to give the authority to establish group work groups either both to the council as a whole, who might, in the course of its business, identify an issue it wants people working on that requires more than counselors, but also to committees. Question is, there's actually some like literal logistical questions here, like how do, how, do, how does a committee or the council decide to create one? So I, I think it may, we might even want to specify, is it by majority vote of the committee to establish one? Um, you could argue, you know, what, what Mandy Joe was saying, of you want to make sure that there's enough buy-in. I mean, you could even put a higher vote percentage, right? You could say by a two-thirds vote of the committee because the assumption is that if you have a five-member committee, and that's still, well, you, It'd be, four. Up, right? It'd be four, right? It'd be four. Then at least you have, if it's if it's four, you have at least four of the seven final votes you might need in the council who are on board with this, right? Um, but that's one way of perhaps indicating how much support is figuring out what vote threshold you need. Then the question becomes, do you have a charge for this work group? And if so, is it written? I by the body that creates it. I I assume is that a collaborative effort, right? Um, then, of course, there's the question of appointing. How do you, who appoints them? It, it would make sense that it's the chair of the committee, except maybe that doesn't make sense because that's a lot of power in the chair, and maybe the chair was that one vote that didn't vote for it, right? And so I think there's actually a lot of complex logistical questions here. Um, and in, in the end, if you have to have a full debate in a committee about whether or not to form a work group, and then you have several debates to construct the charge of that work group, and then you have debates over who to put in that work group, you could talk about like a, it could, in, and given that some committees meet twice a month, um, you could have several months of meetings just getting the work group up and going, and, and that might not be the best use of everyone's time. And so I'd be more than happy to write some language for this, but I think there's still a lot of logistical questions outstanding that. I don't know that I want to be the sole person answering. George. These are all very good questions. Um, 
and maybe for a few minutes we could try just quickly to give Evan a sense of what the feeling of the, th the, the other yeah. two of us is. I would like something that is as easily done as possible. Um, a procedure that um, should not require a great deal of time or um, I mean, not that it be thoughtless, but that, you know, the idea of working group is to get some people together and get something, you know, work on something. So you want to get it um, formed fairly quickly. Um, you want to get it, um, you know, out there and, and started. Um, should it also have a time limit? Should there be, um, would we also expect that um, it would have a, 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 a terminus point for the next month or two months? Is that... Um, but you, you need to, so what, I guess my first thought is whatever we come up with, try to keep it simple at all possible um, and quick <laughs> um, and open, uh, the, the least amount of restrictions possible. Um, probably set a time limit that, you know, uh, you know should be no longer than X, months so that if after uh, some arbitrary number three months six months four months two months whatever we decide um, they need to, to, to wrap it up um, so it doesn't go on and on and on um, so I, I'm so used to pressing the button uh, my my guidance would be similar to George's in a sense um, I think from my time on rules, the, and this is where I've struggled, difference between ad hoc committees and this, the goal of a work group was for that flexibility and quickness. Creating a committee takes a couple of meetings to make sure you're knowing even an ad hoc, sometimes they don't, we've, we've done ad hoc night of um, without charges. Um, so a work group is similar to that type of ad hoc committee, one that you realize, hey, people need to work on this, let's start now. Um, so that flexibility, I think I'd like to see the council be able to do it along with the committees. But again, if it's a council, maybe it falls under the ad hoc committee section, not the work group committee. Maybe that's a slight difference is um, if the council thinks something big needs done, form a ad hoc committee. If a committee thinks there needs to be a little more, that's when the working group comes in. Um, I still struggle with who appoints and how quickly that happens um, because I don't want to see a committee create a work group and that committee appoint only known entities that might be interested. Yeah. I want to, in a way, see a a open process for applying to be on a work group. Somehow, you some open process to register your interest in it. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean I want to see it go to OCA for an appointment in terms of that lengthy process because that can elongate things. Um, but I don't want it to say, you know, and and I hate picking on CRC, but CRC to come in and say, oh, we need a work group on this percent for art or half a percent for art bylaw, we'll appoint you, you, and you because you guys are at today's meeting. Mm -hmm. I, I don't wanna see that happen. I'd like to see some sort of, we need a work group, how do we get applications? How do we find interest of people to get on it um, or recruit experts because there might be an expert that might be interested in serving on a time-limited thing. Um, but I don't know how best to do that. But that's how I want to see an appoint because if the point is to get people involved, we need to be stretching who gets involved, not going to the same people over and over. So that's one of the things I struggle with the most with something like this. Um, I think you could leave it to the chair to a point, you know, if it doesn't work well, we could figure that out and, and try something about that later. Um, and I, I like a time limited, definitely. I'd put it at 90 days or 120, some actual 
three, four months, somewhere in there from the date of creation. But um, I don't know whether that gives you any guidance, Evan. <laughs> um. so, so the, the one thing I want to go back to is my understanding of an ad hoc committee created by the council is that it is composed exclusively of counselors. And I don't see anything in our rules that allows, I don't see anything in our rules that prohibits, but I also don't see anything that explicitly allows. So 10.4, right, is ad hoc mm -hmm. uh, council committees. My read of that would be that it would be these are committees that are composed of counselors. And it's interesting because it does say council charges to establish ad hoc committees, but I don't think we've ever had a charge for one of our ad hoc committees. Um, uh, rules and bylaw rules. review. That's Those are the more long standing yeah, sort yeah, of ad hoc right, right. ones. But um, so. I guess that's my thought on ad hoc committees is that to me anything that the council, anything that originates from the council that is called a committee that serves the council is composed of counselors, whereas work groups allow for non-counselors. But this is, I mean, this is why I'm saying these words, committee and work group, they don't mean anything until you assign meaning to them. And I think that's what we're trying to do here is, right. is, is assign meaning and differentiate so that when we throw out terms like we have the OCA committee and then we have the OCA subcommittee on outreach and then there's the OCA work group on, you know, I don't know, mm -hmm. then, then what's differentiating those, why, right? Why are these called different things? And I think we need some, we need to clarify some of those boundaries. But your question of did that give me more guidance? Yeah, so it seems like the chair of the committee would appoint. Um, do we have a thought on how, I mean, a majority vote of the committee creates a work group? If we're only allowing it to be committees, I think I'd favor two-thirds. But if the council is, I think seven is fine, but right as, as the current draft stands, it's not council at all, it's just standing or ad hoc committees. So if we leave that part, you know, I, if, if we could have two different sections. I mean, so the other thing is, right, I could, I could write something up that has a whole lot of things yeah. for people to then be like, Meh. right, I mean, I'd almost rather write more and have people cut than have people, like, but what about this, what about this, right? I, I think that might be a good plan, George. I think the tougher nut is going to be um, the tension between trying to get something up and running quickly and, and get some feedback quickly and get some people going. Um, and so giving some flexibility and uh, a little bit of um, what? Almost arbitrary power to um, the committee as opposed to the usual procedure of creating these bodies, which is much more, um, you know, plotting and uh, yeah. open. And uh, I mean, it's not, uh, we're, there's a tension here, I guess, between trying to get something done um, and getting people, um, you know, reaching out to people that you think, okay, this person, that person, right? As opposed to going through a long process of, you know, notifying the public and making sure everybody's aware and da 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 da. By the time it's all done, um, you know, so uh, I guess for me, a working group is something that, that falls a little below the level of that degree of, of um, scrutiny or, you know, uh, does that make sense? I mean, it, it, it's, and yet at the same time, we don't want to give the impression that, that it's all insider, you know, baseball. It's all, you know. Um, right. And I think there maybe there's, there's got to be a level of trust, but maybe that's just not possible. Maybe that just doesn't work. But um, this isn't helping, Evan, I don't think. But um, it may just have to, as you suggest, you, you'll present a number of thoughts that you have. 
Some might be a little less, some more informal than others, and we'll just have to look I at I think it. maybe start with a lot, and then at the yeah. next meeting we can yeah. figure it out. We'll have two more members that might help us right. help guide the conversation. But I guess for me, the more flexible, the more informal, uh, the more, um, yeah, but that's just me. And it may not work given other desires, which are also important in terms of openness and transparency. Okay, sounds like we're ready to move on. Um, we'll put that in, may I made a note that Evan will draft something for our next meeting and we'll add it into the next meeting. Before we move on to item four on our agenda, um, I'm gonna continue with some items that were added into either I added at request of others so that we can review them and, and everyone knows that they're there and then things that might need changed based on a legal opinion that was sent to me yesterday by the town manager on voting quantums. Um, since we're on modification of rules, item four is continuing a list of discussion but it doesn't really generate rule modifications. Um, so I'm gonna run through some of them first. Um, the first one is in rule 4.4. Um, the clerk of the council recommended we add the phrase taken by roll call um, to initiate the meeting. Just a sam a, it's what MGL requires, but just to clarify that that requires a roll call vote. Um, so the second sentence of that one reads, the president shall cite the reason and call for a council vote. The third sentence reads, a majority vote. I added the phrase taken by roll call of councilors present and voting at the meeting is necessary to initiate executive session. Um, if, if that can be, a, if we're all okay with that, I'll make note of that. Um, The next one, beyond all the hyperlinks, um, was the, it's part of 5.4 public forums. It's the last bullet point, um, the master plan public forum. The reference was wrong, so I fixed the reference to the charter, uh, but I just thought I'd point it out as to why that number changed as I was adding in hyperlinks. Um, the next one, let's see, rule eight we dealt with today. Um, that's one we already discussed. And so rule nine voting requirements, and this is where a whole bunch of things needs discussed. Um, in rule nine, so the roll call vote that we just talked about for ex entering into executive session, we have a section 9.4 on roll call votes. So I added two bullet points, all votes to enter into or exit from executive session. Um, I will make sure that's the correct reference and add the hyperlink as the comment says. Um, and then all votes to release executive session minutes. Um, that one was based on the <coughs> language we just voted, so I'm just adding those in, if that's okay with everyone, mm -hmm. to make that clear. Just another list more comprehensive as to when roll calls need taken, and again, I'll check the references to make sure they're the right section and then put the right hyperlink in. Um, number of votes required. So this one's got a lot of hyperlinks. Um, the items requiring at least two-thirds of counselors present and voting to vote in favor of passage. This is what relates to the memo we just received from the town attorney. Um, borrowing money, chapter 40, uh, the borrowing authorizations and unpaid bills, chapter 44. All the chapter 44 references, um, the legal opinion we got, which I included in the packet, um, indicates that because of the definition in section one of chapter 44, those votes actually require nine votes because they're two thirds of the full council, not two thirds of those present and voting. So I would like to be able to move those two, which are the second and third bullet points under two thirds of councilors present and voting based on that opinion up to the correct section, nine votes based on that legal opinion. Evan. 
two bullets, the, both under chapter 44? The two chapter 44 ones, the one reads votes on unpaid right. bills from a previous fiscal year and borrowing authorizations. But, but 40, section 5B, spending money to uh, We stay? need to look up. I, I don't know what the oh, definition yeah. on of majority vote on stabilization is. I haven't had the chance, and the memo didn't address that one specifically. Um, so it, if I, and I didn't look it up before this meeting, um, if the definition is the same as chapter 44, section one definition, I would recommend also moving that one up. Um, but I haven't talked to the town about that yet. And since it wasn't directly addressed at this point, I think we leave it there until we look up the definitions. Um, but the second and third ones were addressed in the memo because of the definition. So I think at a minimum, those should go up into the requiring at least nine votes in favor. George? And the memo is in the packet, right? That's yes, right. that's the memo. Right. So with everyone's permission, I will move those up. Is there any, is there something that we can think of that falls under this last bullet? Any other council actions that by statute require two thirds vote of councilors present in voting? Oh, I, I don't know enough statutes to, that, that's why it's in there is the catch all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there might not be. Um. So are we going back to town attorney and asking about spending money from stabilization fund? Um, I will ask the town manager about whether we have an idea as to where that one would be based on the memo, is my thought. And also see if we can read, find a definition. But, um, but yeah, um, I think That is the only one based on the memo. Those are the only two at this point that need moved. Um, if people read the memo differently. Okay. Any other thoughts at this point on those voting quantums? We'll figure out the stabilization fund issue and deal with that one later. Um, and then those are the only changes that I needed to point out. Um, which brings us, I believe, unless anyone else has any recommended or any requests for consideration of changes to the rules to item four on our agenda. So item four is to begin consideration and discussion of the non-rules of procedure revisions um, from the follow-up list. And the first one that I thought we could discuss is to advise on whether the council should seek a further legal opinion regarding the appointing authority for hybrid committees that aren't mentioned in the charter. Um, the example would be an ECAC type charge. Um, there was some individuals, counselors in the rules committee that don't feel the opinion we've received from the town attorney was clear enough on who the appointing authority of committees created by the council that have, that are not count committees of the council that are town committees, who the appointing authority is specifically for the counselors themselves and thought GOL should discuss whether we wanted to ask the town manager for a further opinion on that. Evan. So it's been a while since I read the town attorney opinion on that, um, but my memory of it was that it was fairly clear um, in saying that any committee created, any committee that is not a committee of the council and it wasn't, didn't have appointing authority specified in the charter is appointed by the town manager. Um, and so I'm not quite sure. It does not seem like a good use of our town attorney's time nor our resources to 
get another opinion on that. I, I feel as though that issue's been settled. Do you have any thoughts, George? No, I stand on. Okay. Um, given that we're a group of three, I will weigh in and say I agree with Evan's statements. Mm -hmm. um, and unless there is further dis desire from this committee to do that, I would say our recommendation and our report out to the town council on this matter would be that we don't advise seeking further legal opinion. Unless there's further discussion on this, we will move to 4B. Um, begin consideration of whether to create or to create and recommend a policy for resolutions, proclamations, and citations. Um, this is one we may not have time to deal with fully today, um, given that it is about 10 minutes till the end of our called meeting. Um, but we should think about maybe either assigning someone to potentially draft some language um, into a policy. And I put this as not a modification of rules because, and I'm happy to hear opinions on this, I thought it could be similar to a policy that we drafted like the public ways policy, but it could also rightfully be listed in the rules. Um, I think it depends on what GOL wants as to where to locate such a thing. Um, potential sample language, and I will reiterate that this was drafted by one com member of rules but was not discussed in rules at all, was that um, resolutions and proclamations shall be submitted in writing to the president at least three weeks in advance of an event, and proclamations recognizing an individual or organization shall be limited to individuals or organizations residing, working, or operating in Amherst. Um, that was one potential language again, not discussed by the Rules Committee, so I can't tell you at all or report at all where, what rules thought or where it stood on that one. So I think our goal today is to come up with a plan of attack on this policy. Evan? So as far as whether this is a rule or a policy, I don't have a strong opinion. Um, I mean, 8.1, introduction of bylaws and other measures. I mean, we do specify what needs to be, I mean, included in a bylaw. Um, it, it feels like, so that section is A, non-emergency measures, and B, emergency measures, and there's a little bit of language about bylaws. Um, but it seems like that would probably be where this would go if we decided it was part of the rules. And I think there's, I do think there's a case for it. Um, the goal here is to make sure that we get appropriate and timely proclamations, resolutions, and citations, correct? Um, yes. What were your three words? Appropriate, timely, and it was just those two. Okay. Okay. So I guess there's. I think the reason this came up was a. 
uh, just in, in general, some things that we've been seeing a lot of resolutions, we've been seeing a lot of proclamations. Do we want a policy on what ones we'll consider? Or what ones we won't, number one? And, and the sample language doesn't always address that. Um, but are there certain things we don't want to consider as a council? Um, and then for things like citations, we've done one for some BFW um, individuals. Um, and so a question becomes appropriate. What is appropriate for a resolution? What is appropriate subject matter? What is appropriate subject matter for a citation? Does it have to be someone who's living in town? Does it have to be an organization organized in town or not? Could it be someone who's organized in Hadley or Northampton but does a lot of work in Amherst and is celebrating 50 or 75 years of service? You know, do we want to create rules or a policy around what should be in front of a council and what shouldn't be? Or do we kind of want to just make sure it follows 8.1 and let it go beyond that without any sort of rules related to subject matter or location and things like that? These, up to now, these seem to be generated by some entity, force, power, outside of the council. Um, am I, is my memory correct? Um, no counselor, uh, and correct me here, I've probably forgotten something, but no counselors come forward with a proclamation, resolution, or citation. Um, our pride what proclamation was. The pride, thank you, that's what I couldn't remember. So that would be an example of something that counselors have brought forward uh, to the council um, but everything else is coming from the outside, um, and it goes to the president, is my, my sense, right? It, it's the president who, who, you know, says, here's a proclamation, here's a resolution, here's a citation, right? Um, I think that's the sort of what's been happening with those coming to it's, the it's, council. So I'm imagining somebody others, bringing yeah. something forward and we say, no, no, it's not good enough or it's not, you know, it's not within the scope or it's not appropriate or it's not timely. Um, I don't know. It does seem sometimes to me that we're just a body that um, people get to come to and, uh, you know, and then there may be a, fun may be a, a good purpose to that. It's a chance for them to have something made public. Um, I mean, I've already voted on some things or one way or the other, which I personally would not see as particularly appropriate. Um, but I'm not comfortable with creating a set of rules um, saying what is or what isn't. What, what are your thoughts? Do you, do you feel comfortable with kind of, um, is it, we're trying to, um, filter things out, or are we just trying to put some order in this? Um, it, may, it may just be by nature disorderly. Um, um, people come to us with, you know, thoughts about flags and about, you know, uh, uh, whatever. And uh, maybe we just have to, I don't know, I don't know. Um, and what you're asking, I guess, is would someone on this committee want to sit down and sort of wrestle with this? in terms of, at the moment, we're talking just appropriateness and timeliness, that those are the yeah, two criteria? Yeah, I think criteria? some of it's timeliness. Um, how far in advance of, say, a specific ah, event right. should, if you want a proclamation, yeah. should it be in front of us? I just think it, the reality is that these things just come and it would be sort of curlish to say, nope, sorry, <laughs> it's just not in time, um, right? It's, uh, be nice if things came in a more timely fashion, but my sense is they tend to come when they come. And I'm not sure we can create a policy for it. Um, and appropriateness, I don't know how to define that. We're not gonna settle it today, obviously. Um, no. I mean, I'm willing to sit down and think about it, but I'm, I'm someone who comes from the point of view that, um, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's, um, Evan? Oh, 
freedom. To well, I, I just get it. uncomfortable when we start telling people what they can and cannot proclaim and, and resolve and cite and so on. It's, I don't know. But Evan. Yeah, this is actually tougher, I think, than it originally seemed on its surface. So timeliness, it makes sense to give the public a deadline, right, to say, look, if you want us to consider something for your flag raising, we need to, we have busy schedules and we need to make sure we fit it in, even though proclamations take very little amount of time. Um, so it's nice, it's, it's nice to have those target timelines, right? But I also will fully admit that the proclamation that I wrote with Councillor DeAngelis uh, was received by the president the Thursday before the right. Monday meeting. Yeah. So I would have 100% violated right. any I, I, reasonable No, we timeline. can't accept this right. because right. it's not um, <laughs> so, so, right, I mean, to some extent, you could have a timeline built in that's like, flex. I mean, you, I always tell my students when they ask me to like write them a letter of recommendation, you have to give me a deadline or I'm just gonna put it off, right? But I recognize that that deadline can be flexible. Um, appropriateness is really, really hard. I mean, to some extent, you don't wanna say any citizen out there can write any proclamation and any resolution and then we will take time to talk about it in front of the public, right? I mean, like, you, but on the other hand, how do you determine appropriateness, right? Um, and I don't, I don't, I literally just don't know what the answer is because if you think about, you know, this is, we can talk about proclamation citations, but resolutions are also brought into here. I mean, if you look at our history with resolutions, right? This town has made resolutions on a lot of things that are way outside the scope of this town. You know, nuclear weapons and you know stuff that that would not, to me, be appropriate for the town to necessarily grapple with, but also the public really likes doing that, right? Right. right. And I don't want to tell them no. And then how do you determine, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our uh, proclamations have come from organizations that are celebrating something, right? So uh, Amherst A Better Chance or Amherst Education Foundation. And we love those organizations, right? But what if it was, not that this exists, but it was like, Amherst Right to Life is here mm -hmm. for their first mm -hmm. anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, and, they want the town council. and they want the town council to proclaim the first anniversary of Amherst Right to Life. That would be very uncomfortable, but it would also be really uncomfortable to say, no, no Amherst Education Foundation, fine. You know, right? And there could be free speech issues in there too. Yes. And so I don't know how to put limits on it. Right. Right. I mean, if you don't put limits, if, say, an Amherst KKK comes mm -hmm. for, with a proclamation, if it can be brought in front of us and the vote might go zero thirteen zero, and there is no proclamation, but at least it was in front and, and you're not potentially violating the free speech of saying, yes, we'll hear yours, but no, we won't hear yours. We'll hear it, but that doesn't mean we'll pass it. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know what to do with it. It's a tough issue um, that clearly we're not going to solve today. Do we want to just continue a discussion? Um, do we want to assign someone to try and think about maybe a timeliness, or do we just maybe just want to say, as George was implying, it's it's not something we can do. We could put someone on looking to see whether like Northampton or Greenfield or other ones have. Policies. I was going to suggest that, that I'd be willing to at least look into it, see what's out there, if anything. And maybe the answer is nothing. Maybe the answer is some things we could look at. Um, but starting from scratch would, I think, be an enormous waste of our time and energy. Um, but we could, I'd be willing to do that. Evan. So now that George has volunteered, um, one thing you might want to just think about, so according to the document we have, the sample language we have is from Councillor Brewer, who was the advocate of this. Um, she's also someone who has served a long time 
in our government and done lots of proclamations yes. and resolutions. And so perhaps a first step might be to contact Councillor Brewer and just say, GOL doesn't necessarily know if we need this and we don't understand necessarily how we could define these boundaries and she might have some, since this is of her origination, it might be useful to talk to her about it because maybe she has dozens of examples of times when this has been messed up and we just haven't seen them. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a very good idea. So I will, I agree, I will reach out to Alyssa and uh, also, depending on what she tells me, I may also do some research, but at least do that. At least do that and then report back um, to, to the committee. Excellent. So that is, um, I'm just making notes for next agenda. Um, that takes care of what I had on item four. Item five is public comment. There is no public in the room. So by definition, there isn't public comment, but if it's the only reason why. There's no one here to comment publicly. Um, we dealt with item six, adoption of minutes. We will catch up next week. Um, so I'll, I'll get on those individuals who are drafting the minutes that are outstanding to make sure we have them in time to deal with next week. Um, items not anticipated by the chair. I don't have any. Does anyone else have something? Evan. So just, you know, so I was not on rules committee. Um, there are things that I hoped the rules would deal with that they didn't. Um, now we hold the rules, and so I'm just wondering, I, I really appreciate this future agenda items list. It's always good to sort of have an idea of what's on the horizon. Um, if I was to say, want something on that future agenda items list, would it be appropriate to just email Just email chair? me, okay. yes, and I'll put it on. George. You said next week. Um, oh, sorry, it's not next week. <laughs> it's July 10th, I think. 11, 10, 10 I think is the Wednesday. July, July, um, is, is, but it's July. Yeah. It's July, 10th. July 10th is the Wednesday, so it's July 10th. Um, no, 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 July 10th. Nope, that's not, I'm in August. <laughs> <laughs> we are not in August <laughs> yet. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. That's fine. I'm not trying to cut anyone's summer short. Picked up our minutes last week, which means July 10, and we are adjourning. Um, yeah, uh, if there's nothing else not anticipated by me, it is a motion to adjourn, or though I guess as chair I can just declare us adjourned. You can certainly do that. I, uh, I will uh, declare us adjourned at 12.28 p.m.